In Genesis 15, we read, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. This statement that Abraham left from Ur of the Chaldeans tells us the founder of the Israelite people originated in Mesopotamia and was... Wait a second. Is this the introduction to the Ezra episode? It seems that among the many details that the books of Ezra and Nehemiah have in common, including an entire chapter copied nearly verbatim, even the introductions to these episodes have been duplicated by the Chronicler. But this episode isn't about Ezra, except for the parts that are. This episode is even better than Ezra. I'm your host Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. As a book of the Hebrew Bible, Nehemiah is meant to be read as a sequel to Ezra. The message presented by Nehemiah complements the message of Ezra, bolstering the theology presented in the earlier work. However, as a piece of literature, it's quite clear that Nehemiah can also be considered a standalone book. Some of the problems addressed in Ezra are seemingly dealt with for the first time here in Nehemiah, as if the Ezra material was non-existent. To make matters even more confusing, parts of Nehemiah actually belong in the book of Ezra. Somewhere along the way, while scribes were compiling stories about the journey from Babylon to Jerusalem and the establishment of the post-exilic temple and religion, they created two separate books, each comprised of multiple independent stories. Some of these stories complemented one another, others contradicted each other, and some were placed in the wrong collection. These two collections were gathered up into one book and possibly even placed together with chronicles, and finally they were split again into the books of Ezra and Nehemiah as we have them today. All of this to say that Nehemiah can be read as a sequel to Ezra, or as its own tale of the return and establishment of the law and religion in the post-exilic period. If read separately, then chapters 8 to 9 of Nehemiah would need to be removed and relocated to the book of Ezra. This is confirmed by the book of 1 Esdras, which contains only the Ezra tradition and includes Ezra's reading of the law, which is found in Nehemiah 8, 1 through 12, but completely lacks any of the Nehemiah material. Likewise, 2 Maccabees 1-2 through contains Nehemiah material, but seems completely oblivious of Ezra's involvement in the rebuilding efforts. Sirach mirrors this, but Josephus tells of Ezra's involvement in the return and places Nehemiah later, though he seems to be using a source different from the book of Nehemiah as it's presently known. Finally, for Ezra, places Ezra earlier in time, near the fall of Jerusalem, and there he isn't a scribe familiar with the law of Moses, but actually its author. After the Torah is lost forever, destroyed in the siege of Jerusalem, God dictates the entirety of the Jewish scripture to Ezra during the exile, and Ezra reproduces the texts which were previously lost. And due to the confusion of dates in Ezra, the events of Nehemiah could take place prior to the book of Ezra, making Ezra a sequel to Nehemiah instead of the other way around, with Nehemiah arriving in Jerusalem around 445 BCE during the time of Artaxerxes, and Ezra coming along around 398 BCE during the time of Artaxerxes II. So, these are independent traditions that have been edited together, and there seems to be no clear answer as to who led the return, when it occurred, what reforms were instituted, or when any of this happened. We only have multiple competing traditions that all bear conflicting details and anachronisms. So keep that in mind as we examine Nehemiah. It's meant to be understood as a sequel to Ezra, but that wasn't always the case. The story begins in 445 BCE, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes of Persia, a detail that we learn in the beginning of chapter 2. The first chapter, which was likely added to the narrative at a later date, is just a prayer. Nehemiah's mission to Jerusalem lasts 12 years, until 433 BCE, though the story has been edited and includes mentions of Darius the Persian, who is either Darius II in 424 to 404 BCE, or Darius III, 
336 to 331 BCE, meaning the story may have been compiled and edited as late as the Alexandrian period or later. In the first chapter, Nehemiah hears some troubling news. After inquiring on the state of affairs in Jerusalem from visitors to Susa, a Persian city where Nehemiah currently serves the king, he learns the walls around the city have gaping holes in them, leaving Jerusalem prone to attack and invasion. After a bit of prayer and fasting, Nehemiah speaks to the God of Heaven, a title first mentioned in Chronicles and also used in Ezra, the title for Ahura Mazda of Zoroastrianism. In his prayer to God, he confesses the transgressions of Israel and outlines the current state of the Jews and how the story of Moses and failure to maintain the covenant is what led to the present dire situation among the people of Judah. This prayer and admission of guilt on behalf of the community is similar to that of Ezra 9.6. We've already seen how the covenant story seems tailor-made for this particular argument, as if the story itself was created to set the stage for the Babylonian exile and subsequent return. Here's another example of that idea, Nehemiah reminding the audience that the post-exilic actions of Persian officials are in keeping with the divine covenant that's unknown to the natives of the land. We've seen in the episode concerning Ezra how the introduction of Mosaic Law was meant to separate the settlers from Babylon from the native Judahites. Only those who came from Persian-controlled Babylon celebrated Passover and observed Mosaic Law. Those natives of the land, including those who still remember the first temple, took the new theology as an affront. Here in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, we find another example of this idea. Nehemiah seems to be introducing Moses as a sort of fictive authority to bolster his own ideas. Essentially, the author is informing the recent settlers of Jerusalem that their time as slaves was punishment for the crimes of their ancestors, and their ruined city is evidence of that. And if they wish to avoid future calamity, they must conform to an ancient land contract that the previous generations ignored. So Nehemiah asks God to favor him, and he, the cupbearer to the king of Persia, is selected for a mission for God. Artaxerxes notices Nehemiah's sadness and inquires on the matter. He tells the king of the problems in Jerusalem and asks to be sent to the city to begin the rebuilding process, letters to grant him safe conduct, and for timber for the construction project. Artaxerxes agreed to all of his requests and included an armed escort as well. This scene will appear again in Esther 2, as we're told there that the queen was sitting beside the king when Nehemiah made this request, though in that story she's married to a completely different king, Ahasuerus, whom scholars identify as Xerxes I, which places this story a full 20 to 40 years earlier than Nehemiah does. A Samaritan named Sanballat and an Ammonite named Tobiah learn of Nehemiah's mission and begin contemplating resistance. So just as Ezra encountered resistance from locals when attempting to rebuild the temple, Nehemiah suffers the same concerning the walls of the city. This Sanballat, governor of Samaria, is among those biblical figures attested in archaeological sources. A papyri from the Jordan Valley mentions him during the last years of Persian rule, and another reference from 408 BCE discovered at Elephantini, Egypt, mentions him as well. Though these dates would place him during the time of Darius II, not Artaxerxes. Just one more issue caused by the author being confused about his nation's own history and the timeline of the Persian period. In chapter 2, verse 11, Nehemiah having recently arrived in Jerusalem, sets off on a secret inspection of the city walls by cover of night. This shows that he distrusted the leadership in Jerusalem who could have informed him of the state of affairs. After surveying the damage, which included burned gates and gaping holes in the walls, he summoned the magistrates and informed them that God and the king of Persia support the rebuilding of Jerusalem's defenses. As we saw repeatedly in the book of Ezra, God is often on the same side as the Persian government. <laughs> 
Construction begins in Chapter 3, which recounts which family repaired which sections of the walls around Jerusalem. It's unclear why this tedious list was included, but scholars have hypothesized that the account legitimized certain families or bolstered their claims to oversee various districts within Jerusalem. Thus, it was important as a record. Portions of the wall are said to be repaired by families who live nearby, offering an incentive for them to volunteer for the work. And the Levites and other officials also lent a hand. Verse 12 even mentions a man's daughters engaging in the work, which is an oddity for the Old Testament. This list, which states this family led by this guy who ruled this area, made these repairs to this particular section of the wall, and then the next section was repaired by this other family, and so on, occupies the entirety of chapter 3. If you're reading from the Protestant Bible, which is based on the Masoretic text, but if your Bible is based on the same collection that was used by the Catholics, then the chapter doesn't end with verse 32. It will continue to verse 38. In those verses, we learn that Senbalat heard of the repairs being conducted on the walls of Jerusalem and grew angry. He began ridiculing the Jews with Tobiah the Ammonite beside him, saying the walls would surely crumble. Why the Ammonite was hanging around with the Samaritan at the exact moment they both received news concerning the construction is unclear. I assume it's just convenient to the plot. We also don't know how Nehemiah, the supposed author of this account, heard this exchange from another country, but he apparently did and called on God to smite the two antagonists. Chapter 4 begins with Senbalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, and the people of Ashdod all growing angry with the continued progress in Jerusalem, so they plan an assault. Meanwhile, the residents of Jerusalem were growing tired of the constant toil with no end in sight, and all broke out into song like a Disney cartoon, or a group of dwarves marching around Middle Earth singing about the unending labor. Their enemies were thinking they could sneak in and begin killing the residents before anyone would even be aware of their presence, and once again, we must ask ourselves how the author knows this, especially since these aren't spoken words, but the private thoughts of people who aren't even in the city. But Nehemiah was warned of the impending attack by Jews who lived near the enemies, so he stationed soldiers in hiding spots near the weakest points in the walls and bolstered their courage by informing them all that Yahweh was on their side. Of course, that didn't help the last time invaders approached Jerusalem, which is how the walls were destroyed in the first place. But the invaders somehow learned of these hidden soldiers and realized they had lost the element of surprise, so they abandoned the plan and returned home. From then on, Nehemiah kept half the working force armed to stand guard over those who were engaged in labor. Each section of the wall had a designated trumpeter, and all the workers were assured that God would also fight alongside them, should their enemies attack. But if he can kill 185,000 Assyrians, why would the contracted workers even need to lift a hand? Despite the promise of divine intervention, they maintained a constant guard until the walls were completed. Chapter 5 is a blatant insertion, which breaks the flow of the story, which continues in chapter 6. Just read the last few lines of chapter 4 and then skip ahead to chapter 6 and you'll see exactly what I mean. In the beginning of chapter 5, we learn that the people are in distress, Many had been forced to borrow money to pay for food during the time of famine or to pay taxes to Persia. The trouble came when those Jews who loaned the money were charging interest on said loans, a practice which is forbidden by Exodus 22, 24-26, Leviticus 25, 35-38, and Deuteronomy 15, 7-11. These passages state that Jews can't charge interest on loans to fellow Jews. Worse yet, some of the people had to sell their own children into slavery to pay off the debts. This practice is allowed in the Torah, but debt slaves are to be released once the debt is paid or in the seventh year of service. At least male debt slaves are released after six years of work. The little girls, according to Exodus 21, are not. Nehemiah, 
unhappy with the treatment of the common people by the magistrates, ordered them to return their property and the interest which had been paid on the loans. In the final verses of chapter 5, Nehemiah states he was governor for 12 years, and during that time he didn't take taxes from the people to live on. If this is a statement from an authentic source, we must ask ourselves where his financial support came from. If he wasn't provided for by the people in some way, he must have had either an independent source of support or was financed by the Persian government directly. This is all well and good, but what of those governors who weren't on the Persian payroll? Did Nehemiah expect them to sell their children into slavery in order to put food on the table? He seems to forget that his Persian payroll is financed through taxes collected in Judah. But since that money travels to another country before finding its way into his pockets, he feels he can hold himself apart and above those governors who receive their support directly. Chapter 4 concluded with the completion of the city wall, and in chapter 6 we learn of Senbalat's response. He, along with Tobiah and other mustache-twirling villains, invited Nehemiah to a secret meeting in a conspicuously isolated location where they were totally not plotting an ambush. Nehemiah suspects ill intent, as they've been trying to attack the city since construction of the walls began, and refuses to go. So his enemies sent a letter to Persia accusing Nehemiah of plotting rebellion. How exactly Nehemiah knows the contents of this letter is never expressed, but since he can read their thoughts, perhaps he learned of it that way. In response to the accusation, Nehemiah redoubles his efforts to rebuild the city gates. This accusation of treachery against the leaders of Judah is parallel to Ezra 4, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin accused the city of turning on Persia. At this time, a man named Shemaiah informs Nehemiah that they must meet in secret because he fears a public meeting might expose Nehemiah to assassination. The purpose of their meeting is never made clear, only that it must be held in private. The location of this meeting is set for the temple itself, but Nehemiah refuses out of paranoid suspicion. He believes Shemaiah was intending a trap by causing him to commit the sin of entering the temple. If Nehemiah sought the shelter of the temple, then Shemaiah could spread rumors of this wicked act. At least, that's the suspicion Nehemiah held. He then goes on to accuse Nodiah, a female prophet, of wishing to discredit him. Scholars have suggested that sections of Nehemiah date back to an original work written as an autobiographical account of events an attempt to set straight the record of Nehemiah's own actions during his time in Jerusalem. This chapter is among those sections. If that's the case, and these are in fact the words of the man himself, we're looking at someone who seems suspicious of everyone. The entire city supported the construction project, which is attested by their deeds, yet Nehemiah seems to see enemies lurking in every shadow. There are no overt attempts to disrupt the project at any point, only Nehemiah's suspicions that such acts are in the hearts and minds of his enemies, both outside and within the city. Are Sanballat and Tobiah actually antagonists? Were they actually plotting the demise of the governor of Judah? Or were they merely rulers of other regions of the Persian Empire, the same as Nehemiah? Surely God would have smote them if they had plotted evil, yet no such holy vengeance is anywhere mentioned, and despite months of labor with walls wide open and prone to attack, no armies were ever in sight of the city. Chapter 6 ends with the claim that many of the nobles in the city were plotting against Nehemiah and secretly exchanging letters with Tobiah. Again, no one was caught exchanging letters. Nehemiah just knows that it happened. Either this account is written by some anonymous author from a first-person omniscient view, or these words are the words of Nehemiah, a man suspicious of everyone, including his own supporters within the city, regardless of their actual intentions.
Chapter 7 contains a census of the settlers in Jerusalem, which takes place after the construction of the walls. According to this chapter, houses hadn't yet been built. This contradicts chapter 3, which states where each family lived within the city. The location of their houses decided which section of the walls those families were assigned to. But now, a century after the return, everyone living in the city is still sleeping in the streets. Also, this chapter leads us to believe that Nehemiah is the man responsible for restoring Jerusalem and shows no knowledge of the task being conducted by Zerubbabel and Joshua, as we see in 2 Maccabees 1, or the early chapters of the book of Ezra. So, God commands a census, something which led to the deaths of 70,000 Israelites during the time of King David at the end of 2 Samuel. When Nehemiah conducts his census, he just copies it from the earlier census of Ezra chapter 2. That's right, Ezra 7 is a copy of Ezra 2. Or, Ezra 2 is a copy of Nehemiah 7. We don't actually know which came first, or if they're both copied from a single earlier source. There are, of course, minor inconsistencies, but nothing of note has been changed. As before in Ezra, this list is meant to reaffirm the claims of individuals' rights to settle where they had, which may have involved forcing native residents from their homes or off their land. Remember, the settlers who came from Babylon weren't entering into a vacuum. Judah was a populated nation that suddenly experienced an influx of tens of thousands of settlers from the Persian Empire. Chapters 8 and 9 of Nehemiah do not belong in this book at all. They're part of the Ezra tradition and contain only a single reference to Nehemiah in chapter 8 verse 9, which is widely regarded as a later insertion. A variant of Nehemiah 8 is also found in 1st Esdras 9.37-55, which further suggests this is an Ezra tradition that was misplaced by the compilers of these two books. In chapter 8, all the people of Judah are gathered in a square in Jerusalem to hear Ezra recite the book of the Law of Moses. This is typical of stories in which a new scripture is given. Both Moses and Joshua are said to have presented the law after it was given to them by God. Josiah did the same in 2 Kings. It seems every few books in the Old Testament has someone marching out to present the law of Moses, which no one at the time has ever heard of. During the reading, the Levites explain the law of Moses to the people. Suddenly, there's a verse that states that Nehemiah designated this as a holy feast day and the people shouldn't weep. Typically, Nehemiah is writing in the first person. I did this, I did that, I suspect everyone of treason. But here, he's mentioned in the third person. Nehemiah did this, Nehemiah said that. Clearly, this is an insertion, and it's the only time in the entire section that the character even appears. After this, the text picks up where it left off before the interruption of Nehemiah's sudden appearance, with the people celebrating because they understood the explanation given in verse 7. Then the Levites and heads of ancestral houses gathered around Ezra to study the law so they could understand it. So, they've been explaining the law to the people, but hadn't yet read it or understood it themselves. I'm thankful that middle management doesn't still behave in this manner. They discovered a passage commanding them to build grass huts during this time of year, and this would perfectly solve their housing problem. A problem that didn't exist because A, they'd been living there for over a century, B, lived in houses, and the locations of those houses decided which portions of the walls they'd be rebuilding, and C, The census of the previous chapter settled them in the appropriate locations based on their ancestral claims and into their appropriate houses. Yet suddenly, everyone is homeless again, another indication this chapter doesn't belong here. The book of Moses tells them to build grass huts and live in them during the harvest. This practice hadn't been done since the time of Joshua, but the practice would provide housing for all the people. So what's going on here? 
This is the Festival of Booths, or Tabernacles, a Hebrew harvest festival, and this story is an example of an ideological tale, a story which attempts to provide an origin for a practice. The people would build grass huts in the fields to serve as shelter during the harvest, as many of them had to travel for the work and didn't live nearby. And for those who did live in the area, the huts allowed them to guard their harvest and cut down on travel time each day as they went about their work. The practice has its roots in ancient Canaan, but since it was tied up with a religious holiday, the authors couldn't admit people had been doing it for thousands of years and it was associated with pagan gods, so they invent a new origin story. In this case, it's presented to solve a housing problem which couldn't possibly exist, and it's contained in the Torah itself, which Ezra is now reading and was a forgotten practice. Though that makes little sense, as Ezra was supposed to have presented all of this 13 years earlier when he first arrived in Jerusalem. Once finished with the Festival of Booths, we might expect them to celebrate the Day of Atonement. But that day, among the most important days of the year alongside Passover, isn't mentioned a single time in Ezra or Nehemiah despite their repeated insistence on celebrating all the religious holidays. Chapter 9 instead focuses on a public confession of sins and separation of true Israelites from the foreigners. This is a bit odd since Ezra should have sorted this out over a decade earlier in Ezra 9-10. through And like the previous chapter, this story has no mention of Nehemiah. That means this too belongs in the book of Ezra, which already includes a story of ethnic separation for the sake of purity. So the Ezra tradition grows more complex, containing two separate stories in which Ezra addresses the problem of foreign influence on the Israelite people. The Israelites gather together wearing sackcloth and separate themselves from the evil foreigners and confess their sins publicly. They read from the book of the law of Yahweh, elsewhere called the Book of the Law of Moses. This is likely a reference to the new scripture being presented by Ezra, and other instances that rename it the Law of Moses are referencing the same scripture, but by attributing it to Moses, they can retroject the introduction of this scripture into the distant past. If that's the case, then what we have here in the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 9 is the original title of the text, which would eventually grow into the Torah the book of the law of Yahweh. At this time, Joshua the high priest stood on a platform and cried out to Yahweh. Since Joshua accompanied Zerubbabel on the earlier return to Jerusalem, he must be about 150 years old at this point, another indication that the timelines are all confused. They recite a prayer, which is essentially the synopsis of the book of the law of Yahweh, and their own fictive history, which begins with no surprise here, Abraham leaving from Mesopotamia to settle in the land of Canaan. This establishes precedent for Babylonian occupation of Judah and demonstrates that true Israelites come from the land of the Chaldeans. See my previous episodes on Abraham for the anachronisms that place his story firmly in the post-exilic period. Their prayer jumps to another time of exile, the people living in Egypt and their miraculous release from captivity there, and how they, too, were led by Yahweh to the land where they all find themselves today. As in the post-exilic period, Jews were living in Israel, Babylon, and in Egypt. I can't help but feel this is a merging of multiple traditions that established those Jews in Babylon and in Egypt as true Israelites, linked by their beliefs and practices, and condemning the vile Canaanites who still live in the land as filthy heathens. This is the Deuteronomic school of thought, that true Israelites were inherently righteous, but kept falling away from their proper practices because of foreign influence. This influence was actually the older religion, which they kept attempting to reform and reject. All of their troubles are blamed on that religion in order to subvert it, and they themselves are actually the foreigners. The chapter goes on to claim Yahweh gave the law to Moses and established the Sabbath, 
a practice that actually came from the Babylonians and commanded them to personally enter the land, establishing precedent for their current situation. The golden calf is mentioned, again as the god who brought them out of Egypt and not a foreign deity. So this is a sin of depicting God through an idol, not worshiping a foreign god. The prayer outlines the invasion of Canaan and seizing of the property of the native people, just as the Israelites are depicted doing in previous chapters of this book, again establishing precedent for their current situation. Yahweh gave them saviors to deliver them from their enemies, but they were taken into slavery. This links the current rulers who deliver Israel from the Babylonian captivity with the ancient kings of their glorious past, just as Zerubbabel will be linked with King David through a dubious genealogy. Finally, chapter 9 concludes by stating that because of their past actions, the people of Judah are now little more than slaves. This preserves the sentiment of many Jewish people that they were still subject to foreign rule, the Persians, just as they had been subject to the Babylonians, Assyrians, and Egyptians before them. Though the authors try to depict their attitudes toward the Persian rulers favorably, occasionally sentiments such as this slip through. Continuing the theme of establishing a new scripture, chapter 10 tells us the people entered a new covenant with God. The covenant was put into writing, something which wouldn't need to occur if they actually had the book of the law of Moses, since that was their land deal with Yahweh, but would certainly be needed if it was being established here in the post-exilic period for the first time. Nobles, priests, and Levites are all involved in signing the new covenant, as well as a lengthy list of other officials. This list properly belongs at the end of chapter 13, and their pledge to observe this new covenant reminds us of Ezra chapter 10 verses 20 to 43. This is likely a variant of that same story. They have now separated themselves from the people of the land and will follow the law of Moses, which was all settled in the previous book. They also agree to not marry any of the locals, another issue that Ezra settled over a decade earlier. Also, they agree to not buy from merchants on the Sabbath, something that won't be addressed until chapter 13 and serves to further separate this new Israelite culture from the old. Certain things are to be set aside as sacrifices to God, including grain offerings and the first fruits of the harvest, the firstborn of livestock, and their firstborn children. Looks like they forgot to remove that example of human sacrifice from their records. They must also celebrate the new moon and observe the Sabbath. The taxes and tithes for the temple will be collected by the Levites, and this will provide for them and the priest so they won't have to get real jobs. Chapter 11 begins by telling us that the administrators took up residence in the city of Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots. One-tenth of them would live in the city, while the remaining 90% would settle in other towns. The chapter then goes on to provide a series of lists. It lists people who settled in Jerusalem, lists of priests, Levites, gatekeepers, temple servants, settlements outside of the city, settlements where the Benjaminites live, and others, and so on and so forth. An entire chapter of lists to settle the question of where people lived as if they hadn't been there for a century by this point. We learn here that the temple singers are Levites, and their duties were assigned by royal decree. We also learn that Nehemiah saw Jerusalem as being underpopulated, so a tenth of the population was brought in from the countryside to bolster the resident population, which comes to about 3,000 people. If this is one-tenth of the total populace, that means Judah only held about 30,000 people though we aren't sure if this includes women and children or those deemed people of the land. At the beginning of chapter 12, we find something interesting. The chapter begins with a list of priests who returned with Zerubbabel and served under Joshua the high priest. Ezra is listed among them. This is strange, as the book of Ezra depicts him as a Persian scribe, not a Jewish priest, and he didn't return with Zerubbabel, but let his own return at a much later date. At that time, he served as a national leader with unparalleled power in the Western Persian Empire, not as a mere priest working within the new temple. 
The chapter then goes on to list Levites, and at the end of this list makes reference to Darius the Persian. There were three kings of Persia named Darius, and our only clue as to which is referenced here is that the book of Nehemiah appears to only know of one king, Artaxerxes. If they were unaware of the second Artaxerxes, then they couldn't possibly be aware of the third Darius. And since the events portrayed occur after the time of Darius I, this Darius the Persian is most likely a reference to Darius II, who reigned from 424 to 404 BCE, which tells us this list is meant to include priests and Levites from the time of the initial return until the time of Darius II. But we're also told that the Book of Chronicles was used as source material for these records. This should raise eyebrows, as we've already seen how the chronicler frequently invented any information he felt would justify his theology, invented lists and records to support his claims, and changed history on a whim. He also invented sources in order to claim legitimacy for the changes he made to his records. So, listing Chronicles as a source makes this list in Nehemiah as dubious as any found in the Bible. Following these lists is a dedication of the wall, which was completed several chapters earlier. If we were to remove the Ezra material and later insertions, then chapter 12, verse 27 should follow on the heels of chapter 7. Singers from among the Levites were arranged into choirs on the walls, and this section returns to the first-person narrative style seen elsewhere in the section scholars call the Memoirs of Nehemiah. Among the singers for the dedication were Jeremiah, Zechariah, and Ezra. This mention of Ezra, like that of Nehemiah in chapter 8, verse 9, seems to be a later addition. There were great sacrifices to go along with the singing, and everyone rejoiced. Priests and Levites carried out purification in accordance with the prescriptions of David and Solomon, for there were songs of praise to God in those days. A couple of things to note here. First, we have no surviving records of prescriptions of purification from David or Solomon. Those are all attributed to others, such as the Mosaic Law Code and the Levitical Law Code. This may be an attempt to attribute the purification rituals of the Levites to David and Solomon, just as the law brought from Persia was attributed to Moses. Second is the reference to songs of praise in the days of the first temple. Singing as a means to invoke the presence of Yahweh would eventually fall out of favor in the Jerusalem temple, but here we find a clear reference to this ancient practice. Finally, at the end of chapter 12, we find that the structure of worship and sacrifice has been fully instituted. If one wishes to make an offering, they must give their offerings to the gatekeepers, who in turn give them to the Levites, who then pass them on to the descendants of Aaron, who serve as priests. This clearly marks out the tiers of authority within the Jewish temple. The final chapter of Nehemiah addresses a series of problems which arose within the community due to Nehemiah's absence. The first of these, which appears twice in the chapter, is the problem of mixed-race marriages and children. This appears in chapter 13, verses 1 to 3 and 23 to 28. It's discovered during a reading of the book of Moses that no Ammonite or Moabite may be admitted into the assembly of God because they did not meet the Israelites with food and water. Instead, they hired Balaam to curse them. This is a reference to the story of Balaam and the talking donkey from Numbers 22 to 24. This problem of mixed races was already solved earlier in Ezra chapters 9 through 10. Yet we're seeing it again at the end of Nehemiah. Another indication that we're dealing with multiple versions of the same story, and both versions have been included in these two books. Some of the children spoke the language of Ashdod, so it was decided that all those of mixed descent would be separated from the Israelites. So basically, Nehemiah is taking children from their parents and sending them off, presumably to neighboring nations. At one point, Nehemiah physically attacked some of the Jews who had taken foreign wives, beating them and ripping out their hair while shouting that they shouldn't marry non-Jews or allow their children to marry outside of the community, 
referencing Solomon being led astray by idolatrous women. Our old friend Tobiah returns to the narrative for the second problem. After scheming against Nehemiah during the rebuilding of the wall, he takes up rooms inside the temple complex with the approval of a temple priest. In verses 4 through 9, we learned that a storeroom for grain, incense, vessels, wine, and oil was emptied out to provide living quarters for Tobiah. This occurred during the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, which would be around 433 BCE. Living in the temple was a sin, so naturally Nehemiah was upset. He had all of Tobiah's belongings tossed out and the chamber was purified, so the original contents could be stored there once again. Remember back at the end of chapter 10 when it was decided the people would all donate to the Levites so they could maintain the temple and these donations would also provide for the Levites themselves? That was written in anticipation for the problem which appears in Nehemiah 13 verses 10 to 14. The money stops flowing to the Levites, possibly because it's been given directly to the priests instead of being handed to the gatekeepers, who then pass it on to the Levites and finally the priests, with each group along the way taking their cut. However it occurs, the Levites no longer have a source of income, so they all abandon their posts to work in the fields. This causes the temple to suddenly fall into disrepair, so Nehemiah chastises the magistrates for neglecting the house of God. Apparently, no one else could have possibly performed their duties, which shows the Levite author's concerns here. Levites must be kept in comfort and mustn't be replaced. Nehemiah then has the Levites return to the temple and resume their duties. Once they return, the tithes begin flowing again and the Levites are placed in charge of the tithes and the storerooms, where they presumably didn't govern before. Finally, we deal with work on the Sabbath. This is a serious offense, and the Torah would have you killed with rocks if you committed the heinous crime of yard work on Saturday. Here, Nehemiah is a bit more lenient, though he does lose his temper a bit at times. Beginning in verse 15, Nehemiah addresses this problem. He notices people pressing grapes on the Sabbath as well as hauling grain and performing other sinful acts. Basic commerce on Saturday offended Nehemiah so much that he ordered everyone to cease selling goods. He reprimanded the nobles for allowing such disgusting behavior and informed them that profaning the Sabbath is the reason God brought destruction to Israel. It's important to point out that two kings tells us idolatry was the reason for the destruction. One more instance of the author using their own theology to rewrite history. To deal with the problem, he had the gates of the city closed on the Sabbath, so traveling merchants couldn't enter the city to sell their goods. When some of the merchants slept near the walls outside the city, Nehemiah lost his cool. Shouting like a madman, he threatened to personally beat them until all the merchants left. I suppose loitering also profanes the Sabbath, according to him? With all of this done, the temple cleared of squatters, foreign marriages dissolved, and the mixed-race children cast out. The Sabbath workers threatened, and the Levites returned to their rightful duties. Nehemiah had cleansed the foreign contamination and returned the city to rights. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. We'll be continuing with the Book of Esther in the next episode and discussing some of the various versions of the Bible when we do. If you'd like to support the show, there's an Amazon wish list in a pinned post on my Facebook page. The books in that list help with research for future episodes. You can also shop the merchandise from my Zazzle store, which can also be found on that same pinned post. Just visit facebook.com slash dragonsandgenesis. And you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash dragonsandgenesis. If you have any questions regarding mythology in the Bible, send them to me at dragonsandgenesis at gmail.com, and I'll answer your questions in a video on my YouTube channel over at youtube.com slash dragonsandgenesispodcast. Don't forget to give a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, and check out the site over at dragonsandgenesis.com for links, episode information, and a list of recommended reading. And as always, thank you for listening.